So now that we've finished with our overview of Java synchronizers in general, it's time to start delving deeper into some of the most basic synchronizers, which are the atomic operations. And we'll first start by recapping what an atomic operation is. I, I gave you an overview earlier, but now that we're really gonna talk about these in earnest, we'll go into a little bit more detail and show some more examples. And we'll talk about some of the key concepts associated with atomic operations in Java. And let's start first with what is an atomic operation. So an atomic operation is a synchronizer, a very low level synchronizer, that is used to ensure that changes to a field in a Java program will always be consistent and visible to other threads. And that really is the essence of atomicity. So if you look at the link down below, you'll see a nice overview that is provided as part of the Oracle documentation of Java that kind of goes through this in more detail. So please feel free to click on these links if you'd like to learn more about this. I'm gonna give you a bit of a synopsis of that, but if you want more, you can go and read those descriptions. So an atomic operation is one that either happens all at once or doesn't happen at all. And again, the analogy I always love to use is the transporter beam in Star Trek, if you're a Trekkie, um, where you beam someone from one place to another, obviously you don't wanna beam part of the person. And the other example we'll see later is uh, disapparating in Harry Potter, where you don't want to have you know, your arms and legs go someplace, but your body and your face stick around where you were trying to come from. So the main point of, of both of those analogies, of course, is we don't want to stop in the middle and leave things in some inconsistent state. Wouldn't, wouldn't be a good, uh, would, would not be a good way to, to live if you, if you beamed only part of a person to someplace. Any side effects of atomic operations will not be visible to other threads until the operation completes. And that's what really makes it all or nothing. That's what makes it fundamentally atomic. So there are three primary concepts that are associated with atomic operations in Java. And you can take a look at the link at the bottom of the page to learn more about these three concepts. And as the title of the link implies, atomicity, visibility, and ordering are the three main concepts. So atomicity deals with which operations have indivisible effects. And we'll take a look at a simple example. This is again, kind of a recap from what we've talked about before. So I won't dwell on it, but imagine that we've got a class which I've aptly named non-atomic ops. And I've made just a good old long field called M counter, which is gonna keep track of count. And that's what we refer to in the, in the nomenclature of concurrency as mutable shared state. And the reason why it's mutable shared state is it's gonna be changeable by multiple threads and readable by multiple threads. So here you can see we've got two methods, increment and decrement. Increment runs in thread T2, decrement runs in thread T1. And if we were to run this program, you would get inconsistent results. And I've actually got some examples in my uh, GitHub repository which demonstrate this. And it's, it's very strange because you get these weird results. And you're like, what is going on here? And that's because incrementing and decrementing a field in the manner I've done here is not atomic because there's actually multiple things going on. We're going to read the contents into a local register, the contents of memory of the M counter field into a local register in a core. That'll be incremented in the local register in the core, in the cache, if you will. And then when we're done, we're gonna write it back to, to the main memory. And those are actually multiple operations, multiple steps. And you could have interleaving and you can have what we talked about before with uh, read-write conflicts and write-write conflicts and all this good stuff. So you'll end up with inconsistent results. Visibility determines when another thread can see the effects of its associated thread. So some other thread that it's collaborating with. And this is a subtle point and it, it doesn't make sense at first when you just look at the code, but when you understand what's going on in the hood, and you think about how the Java memory model's working, it gets a lot more sensible. So let's make this example come to life. We have, a, we have an example called loop may never end, and you'll see why we call it that in a second. We define a field called m done, which is just a good old Boolean that we assign the value false to. And notice this is unsynchronized and it's mutable shared state. 
just like the example we looked at before with M counter was unsynchronized and mutable shared state. So now we have two threads. One thread is going to uh, be calling this work method. And you can see what it does. It basically just says while um, not done. In other words, while done is set to false, do some work. And that's what thread T2 does. And then thread T1 is going to call stop work. And what stop work's trying to do is it's trying to set M done to true. And of course, the intent of this, very obvious intent, we're trying to stop thread T2 from, from doing its work. Well, because we've defined this to be a Boolean and it's unsynchronized, we don't know if or when that change to M done will be propagated from thread T1's local cache on some core to thread T2's local cache on another core. And that's because we've done nothing to ensure that the change to M done will be visible to the other thread. And because of the Java memory model that we talked about earlier, it may take a long time, perhaps forever, for that to be propagated. Now, obviously, uh, you might think, gee, that's kind of useless. Well, that's not, in fact, correct. There's actually good reasons why it works this way to enable caching and faster performance. But we're going to have to apply Java synchronizers properly, or in this case, Java atomics properly, in order to make those changes visible in, in a timely way and in a desired way. And then the third topic is even more subtle, and this is really crazy when you're first exposed to it, because it doesn't match our intuition for sequential code at all. And this is what's called ordering, which determines when the operations in one thread occur out of order with respect to other threads or another thread. Could be one, could be two, could be n. So here's an example I call badly ordered, and you'll see why. So badly ordered defines two fields, A and B, that are both set to false. And then in thread T1, we're going to set A to true and B to true in that order. So you would think, oh gosh, you know, A will get set first, followed by B. Down here in method two in thread T2, we are going to read the contents of A and B. And because of the fact that there's no ordering guaranteed for unsynchronized shared mutable data, it might be the case that uh, Boolean R1 would get the value true, but Boolean R2 would get the value false, even though A was set before B lexically in terms of the, the text, it might turn out that the way that those values get propagated to the memory system would turn out that B would get set to true before A. And then later, if you check a again, immediately after you, you checked it before, you might see true now. And so, of course, that's going to lead to chaos and insanity because the ordering is not preserved. And you would spend an awful lot of time looking at your code, completely perplexed as to what the heck was going on, not understanding that under the hood, the Java memory model with multiple threads enables and in fact encourages out of order memory uh, operations that pass each other in the memory hierarchy so that the textual order doesn't match the order in which they get propagated to other caches. Once again, this is by design. And if you don't like this, then you use synchronizers to get the desired effect. So that was just a quick overview of the concept of, of atomicity. We aren't really talking too much yet about how Java deals with things, just giving an overview of, of atomic operations in general.